<laughs> All right. Welcome. This is us. And it was created. Us was created because everything is us. Every, every living thing, every vibration, every part of the universe is part of us. But what we need to be doing is working with each other to become a little more tuned in. Maybe understand things from a more, uh, I don't know if you call it basic or a more uh, intellectual level or in a more um, energetic level, whatever the hell you want to call it. Anyway, to progress as human beings, progress as individuals, as family members, parents, whatever, athletes, all of those things change as you change your vibrational frequencies. When you change your vibrational frequencies, it's done in several, a lot of different ways. Um, some people come from, there are people that come from totally isolationists. Uh, some people are all about deprivation, you know, depriving themselves of things. Some people do it through indulgence, one thing or another. I did it indulging on weed. <laughs> anyway, not just weed, but whatever. <laughs> so, anyway, but we do what we do to get where we're going. And even people that seem like they're not getting anywhere or making any changes, they are. They are in little tiny bits that eventually connect and they wind up going through a full change they didn't even expect. Um, like I said, in the lots of times, I got to hear without even trying to do it because as I started to understand things, I became more in tune and the ability that I work with every day become more second nature. I don't see it as a gift. I see it as a human ability that everybody has. No one's better than anybody. Nobody has more than anybody. Nobody's got more strength or more intelligence. It's none of it's all that bullshit. What it comes down to, we all got what we have, what we need. It's just a matter of what you do with it. Everybody can walk, but not everybody does a marathon. Everybody can play a piano if they want, unless you're missing some hands or fingers. But, you know, not everybody's Mozart. And it doesn't mean you can't become Mozart. It just means you ain't there at birth. So, anyway, having all that stuff. Um, this is where we are on this podcast. I'm here with uh, Kendall Williams, co-host. Go ahead and you can say hello oh, now. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> you hello I now. didn't want to interrupt you. I was rolling. I was. That. I was like, well, he's rolling, and that's I was a rolling. great. I didn't even. That's a that. great lead into <laughs> the conversation that we had talked about. So yeah. I was like, okay, is that what he's doing? Or is he leading us right there? He had no clue. <laughs> <laughs> no clue what I was doing. I mean, you know, when I was driving over here, I was like, okay, what am we gonna say? What am we gonna do? Ah, oh, screw it. Figure it out when it happens. I just, you know, just this is all for me. It's spontaneous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's spontaneous. I love spontaneity. Anyway, that being said, uh, one thing is if a lot of you guys already know, she's pretty well known. So Kendall does, uh, is really kind of an expert in the Tantra field. And um, hell, I didn't know much about it. And then we were talking and I found out there was a shit ton more things involved in that that I had no clue. And so we're going to talk about it now. And uh, so there we go. Let's talk about it now. <laughs> well, I want to actually going to roll back to some of the things that you said before we roll forward into the sexy word of Tantra. Yeah. So <laughs> like, a, lot of, a lot of people go, huh, oh, Tantra. Oh, <laughs> Tantra, yeah. Ooh, all right. This is going to be a sexy conversation. We're going to learn all about those positions and lasting longer and, yeah. and uh, you know, full body orgasms and all that good stuff, right? Yeah. yeah full body is cool. Yeah, get to that. But you had made, tingling. well, you made conversation around, you know, your, your lead in there was around your gift that you don't count as a gift. Mm, right? Yeah. And I was like, fuck yeah, it's not a gift, <laughs> right? Not. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. And I've been around so many different people that believe that, you know, the, the gifts of spirits are only given to those who are ordained in a certain fashion or form, right? Yeah. Like that. And it's like, well, and depending on what side of the fence you're on, you could either be very demonic with your psychic abilities, yeah. or you could be highly gifted yeah. with your psychic abilities. So it really just depends on what faith you're falling underneath, right? Yeah. But at the end of the day, you have the gift of sight. Right. right? It's still the so, same technique. I mean, it's the same stuff. 
just point pointed a different way. Right. Yeah. And with that gift of sight probably comes the gift of being able to experience energy in different ways to be able to, you, you probably, I guess I don't know exactly how you get your read done, but I would imagine that it might come through vision, through, through feeling, yeah, through, it. yeah, through different yeah. emotion that you might have that comes up, pictures, do you name it, what's popping up on the screen? It's not just the screen up here that when I say screen here, because for me, I see things that will pop up mm -hmm. here. Sure. I also feel emotion. I also get extremely hot hands during, you know, my mentoring sessions or back in the day when I did more tantric work, very, you know, extremely hot hands. So the laying on of hands that you would have all those gifts of spirit, you know, and it's like, well, what did I do to get here? Yeah. I was born. That's all it took, right? <laughs> I all was took. born. That's all it took. Right. It's like, well, how did you get here? How did you learn that? Oh, um, I don't know. My mom and dad did this thing one day, and voila, here I am. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it could be anything. It could be anything. Right. You know? And I, I agree. It's like it's not – I think that the gifts of spirit, you know, are not gifts. They they are natural born um, abilities that we can choose to fine tune or not. Right. Exactly. Uh, now the thing about it is because it's not taught, you know, mainstream taught, then we're up against, okay, what's going to trigger it Right. that you're going to actually start, right. you know? And, uh, typically some catastrophe, something, yeah. <laughs> my little boy quit breathing. Right. And I had to say it was, I had to save him. He was only two weeks old. He's about this long. Mm. And he quit breathing. And uh, I was I was looking for some contract to kill people back then. I went through a little bit of a thing here. Anyway, I didn't actually do it. Anyway, um, he quit breathing, and I was holding him, and he was starting to turn color, you know. And I was patting his back and going through all this nonsense. And I was going... You're a good boy. Don't die on me, you know? And I hadn't given a shit about nothing up to that point, or I didn't think I did. Mm -hmm. Next thing I know, I'm back in this on the back of this car. I'm patting him, and I'm just tr trying to, come on, you're going to be okay. Just come and, you know, begging him not to die. And this um, person yelled to me to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth on the kid. I didn't know till later you can blow a kid up that way. You screw their lungs. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. He didn't die. But I got him breathing finally. Mm-hmm. And I went into his bathroom because, well, we took him to the hospital. He was okay. He, was, he had born, been born early, so he had some shit going on. And we brought him back, and the wife was feeding him. And I remember watching her feed him. I thought, God damn, he almost left. I, and all of a sudden, I was overwhelmed. I went into the bathroom and cried like a little girl for like a couple hours, you know, just totally. And I've been... And I went into a search after that because I didn't want him to turn into me, you see. And uh, so I started going into search on how the brain works. Why was I twisted? Because mm -hmm. I was twisted. I wanted people to hurt. Okay. So I started looking into different things and got into Dianetics. And, you know, Dianetics is the, mm -hmm. the precursor to Scientology. Right. I never got into Scientology. They always had their hand in my pocket. And I wasn't into it, you know. <laughs> But I did the Dianetics, and I was able to find out where the where things were going on, what was going on, you know. And then I was in, uh, I kept still sliding back into the drugs. And then I was in Hollywood, actually Lennox. And I just did a party of, shit, every drug you can imagine. And I picked up my youngest son. I looked at him. He looked like he was made out of rubber. Shit, here I am again. And so then I was watching TV, and this metaphysical woman was coming up with all this stuff. And this woman goes, "If you if things are so easy, how come people are on drugs and poverty and shit like that?" She goes, "Well, look it up from out from under that when they're ready." Oh, shit, I'm ready, you know. Mm -hmm. So I went and I got this trade paper, kind of like the Holder's Network was here. I forget what it's called. Either way, I had one of those. And uh, this guy comes up to me, he's in a robe and sandals and wants me to join his cult because he almost died. And I said, just go away, bro. 
<laughs> really. Anyway, I get this paper and I open it up. It's like, okay, I'm going to kill 100 bucks. One side was a woman channeling. I said, she can blow smoke, and I won't know, possibly. This other guy was going to do a regression, and I thought, shit, he's going to make me see things. That's pretty damn cool. It used to take a lot of money from LSD to get me to see things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, so I did it, and without going to the whole story, it uh, made me realize that the anger that I carried, the viciousness and everything, and was all about wanting people that didn't like me or whatever just to not want to say it. <laughs> and that was how it was worked out, right? As soon as I got that, I kind of, everything started to make a little more sense. You know, and it was something, it was such a simple thing, but everything started making sense. And I was doing what we were talking about in the last one about those anger knots. Mm -hmm. I started working on that. And I started seeing shit, a lot of shit to where I'm going, oh man, I'm losing it, you know. But it all landed here. And so it, it was actually something that wasn't even in my plan, conscious plan. But here I am. And, and again, this isn't a gift, you know, it's just an understanding. Or the way it seems to be. <laughs> An understanding, but the frequency change that you Definitely experienced changed. to go from what we can call such darkness in spirit to be bogged down and covered up like that. Mm -hmm. The light that you were masking, your potential to actually, I mean, you wanted to destroy people in the world and now you help people yeah. in the world. In the last I show you it. shared that yeah. you've helped like 14, 15 people not commit suicide. Yeah. You know, like if you think about it, how, what potential just right there occurred in the world? What could those 14, 15 people that you saved, what, what have they gone on to do? What kind of ripple did that make yeah, in the world to think about, that yeah. had you stayed in that darkness and made that decision to stay there, to not turn, to not be done mm -hmm. with that, what would have actually happened that to those 15 people? Yeah. You know, because maybe you were the only person that could have gotten them out of that. And because you got them out of that, they went on to assist others. And those others went on and on and on. So look at the thousands, just with those 15. And the ripple effect, yeah. Just the ripple effect from that. Yeah. And when you get into the energetic aspect of things, you know, it, we, we get caught up in the land of success and the land of, you know, like, I need to make this big, humongous impact. Well, you help one person, you make a humongous impact, right? Yeah. Because there is a ripple effect to that because you don't know what that, that impact with that one person actually does. How many people does that person touch and so on and so forth. And it just goes out. Yeah. My path was, you know, you were asking about Tantra and everything and, and my path, how, cause I've kind of what I refer to as going full circle mm. and I was a little girl who um, liked to kill bugs. I had my circus of insects. Mm -hmm. I had a passion of just, you know, taking bugs and putting needles through them and making them do things. And I had my ring of fire and my oh, shit. this and I, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Like I got that side. I had that. I grew up with a daddy who had a gold claim and shot animals and I've seen things gutted and dissected right in front of me plenty and you know, it's like I've got I've got all this different stuff and I ha love blood and guts. Yeah. I am not the airy fairy, you know, lovey dovey movie chick. I want um, you know, I I like war. I like blood. I like blowing shit up. I love that. I'm very guy centric on guy -centric. my on my on my movie watching and stuff, right. I'm like, yeah, like, yeah, let's get it out. You know, like, Christ, take the head off. That's good to me. Yeah. Which is not typically, you know, oh, a woman. Does it feel like a release, though? It does. It's yeah. like there's, I've, I always proclaim I live in all this light and love over here. In order for me to be nice to you, I need shit dying somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, it's I got to keep the harmony keep the there. Balance. I got to keep the balance of my world right. And yeah. so I'm not killing you for your stupidity. <laughs> Instead, I am... You know, going to just watch watch this, you know, Game of Thrones. Mm. There you go. <laughs> watch that. But what I was, you know, in in that growing up in a very natural fashion and just kind of being let to roam, I, I was very tomboy. Mm. 
I was let roam and everything. I also was extremely caring towards things too. There was yeah. not just blood and guts and right. everything. You know, I I had a nurturing side as well, and I had my Barbie dolls and my paper dolls, and I loved to draw and did all that kind of stuff. And I had a lot of energy based things that I thought was normal. I didn't know that they weren't normal because right. I was an only child. Yeah. And I grew up out in the middle of nowhere land and I had one little friend and that was it. And I didn't go to school until I was in third grade. So I really didn't have a scope of what normalcy was. Right. My best friend for a long time was a rattlesnake underneath a great uh -huh. big boulder, you know, like right. until my dad killed her. Uh, but yeah, I see that was mean. It I was, was like really, really mean. It he was. made me very mad. I'm still <laughs> mad at I love you, Daddy, wherever you are. <laughs> Still mad about the snake, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but mm -hmm. but I had a lot of I you know I I saw things I had my imaginary friend, my mm -hmm. mom told me you're creative, you're a very creative little girl, and I thought okay well what does that mean you know what does a five year old know what the word creative really means yeah. the extent of it, and I remember taking trips that you know. Fast forward many years, get some psychedelics in your system. You're like, wow, I did that mm. when I was five and I didn't have anything in my system. Yeah. All right. That's like, I remember doing that stuff. And I was like, wow. And then, you know, I got into my teen years. Sex came into the picture. A boy came into the picture. Mm -hmm. A smart boy came into the picture who had this thing called Tantra that he was reading on and studying on and all that. And he, he was also into meditation and metaphysics and energy and ley lines and past life regression and all this cool stuff that I had been studying. I just didn't have the Tantra piece in there. Right. And so he kind of awakened me to the sexual aspect of energy because we were very focused on Margot and Nod's book and, and her reading and her study and everything and learning about the sexual component of energy and connection work. Mm. So I thought for a long time, much like you, when we were talking, you know, oh, Tantra's about sex. That's what that is. Yeah. And as I grew and developed my understanding around it, I realized, oh, that's not, that's like, um, if he, and I refer to Tantra as an apple pie. I'm like, Tantra is an apple pie. And it is really just the sex component of it is one apple slice in the apple pie. Right. That's how much of the apple pie is sex. sex. Yeah. All right. So if you have a whole pie and if one slice is sex, yet we apply all the focus on just that one slice, how much are we missing? Right. And it's much like quantum physics that teaches us, oh, we're missing 98% of reality. Yeah. All right. We only focus on the 2%. That's it. What is actually going on in the 98 that we don't see? which is the land that you play in, which is the land yeah. that I've learned how to play in. And it's like, what are those gifts of spirit that we're choosing to play? Tantra is just another component of a clarifying agent to awaken us to energy. Right. The very simplistic term. So through the course of time, I went down the whole sexual path, teaching about sex, teaching about energetics in sex, teaching about connection, the, the frequency of the heart, how that relays into our sex that obviously sex can be great, just the physical act of sex, but what if you want gourmet sex? What if you want to touch the big toe of God sex, right? What if you want yeah. that? You would talk yeah. full body orgasm, well, you're not gonna get that from some friction-based fast food sex. <laughs> yeah. It's just not gonna fast happen food, yeah. because it's fast food. You're yeah. never gonna enjoy the full course meal if you're always running through the fast food line. Right. right, and we live in a world that we run through the fast food line in every aspect of our life, That's true. but we want the results of the gourmet five course meal. Yeah, and tantra is mostly about slowing yeah. the fuck down, yeah, we getting Walmart present. Is. Right, we went right, just <laughs> disposable, it's right. disposable. Our relationships disposable, the sex is disposable, the food's disposable, our house is disposable. And you were talking about being a minimalist. Well, a minimalist is just to get good something good quality that yeah. you need, that yeah. you're going to use, and don't have 10 of shit nonsense. sitting there that's yeah. nonsense, yeah. right? Yeah, I agree. Make sure that your footprint's just what it needs to be, not this massive amount. One person does not need to take up the space for 10. Right. Yeah. So. Get it. Yeah. You know, that would, uh, when you do that, that uh, the Tantra aspects or whatever, um, 
Like you go from the sex aspect. If you use music, use music, use lighting, all of that changes things too. Mm -hmm. You see, um, there's actually a technique that you probably already do this, but where you can actually feel somebody touch you from the other side of the freaking world, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's pretty fascinating. But if you ma you marry those two things, all of those things. It's those are the other part of that pie you're talking about. You marry all that stuff together, you, you just, there's no better, right. you know, no better place to be. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, like, sometimes I'll look at my kid and I'll take a few breaths and I find, I just decide I'm going to be him for a couple seconds. And I can feel things that he wouldn't have told me. Right. Or I can do that with a dog. It's really about that connection. And from the point of view that you're saying the pie, yeah, if you have, if you take the time to get that connection to where you can really feel the vibration, really feel everything that's involved. Like instead of, like you touch somebody, instead of just touching them and touching their hat, whatever, whatever, you feel the skin texture, you feel the vibration, you feel peach fuzz, whatever the hell, mm -hmm. but you do it. And I, I do a thing called Munichy, Munichy Rites. It's from the Andes Mountains, mm -hmm. or so, anyway, South America. And part of it is has to do with manipulating energy centers. Well, I created one. This people came to me, and they went through a lot of nonsense, and they, uh, they couldn't even get sex worked out anymore. And so I came up with an idea. I call it Munichy 10, and it's really not. I invented it, I invented it myself. So it's whatever the hell I want to call it. But anyway, I'm mm -hmm. going to call it Munichy 10 for the minute. What I do, I start with the top of their head. I have them facing each other. Mm -hmm. Then I have them reach over. Okay, you put your hand up against their face, but not top. Right. Now, when you do that, I want you to tell your wife, say it's from Nan's point of view, I want to tell your wife what her face feels like just by concentrating on the feeling of your palm. And then you do that, then you go down. Okay, how about here and here? They don't even get to their waist, and they're connected. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then the other, usually if they practice that within a, God, just a two or three days, they're cool again. They just had to reconnect. Right. You know, and that, that's the that's the whole thing. And it's you know it's not just sex as you, as you were saying, it's in everything. You know, if you can indulge your, you can just immerse yourself into things then everything changes, you know what I'm saying? You have to embody yourself before you can actually feel anybody else. If yeah. you're not present in yourself, then you can't be present with somebody else. Right. But we live in a world where, you know, it is that fast food mentality, disposable everything. Mm -hmm. And that means that we're also not really here inside of our own beings. We're not witnessing, we're not feeling our... We're, we can't feel our breath. We can't feel our heartbeat. We don't feel our emotions. We tap out on everything. Oop, I felt something and what? We're going to shut it down. Uh, give me a drink. Give me some drugs. Give me something. Whatever. Give me some TV. I'm going to pick up my phone. I'm going to scroll. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to do anything to avoid feeling. Dealing with it. Yeah. Right. And as long as we refuse to feel ourselves, then we're not ever going to be able to tap in like what you're talking about to be able to feel our partner. Yeah. And a lot of tantric work, it's not about the sexual practice. You know, everybody wants to last, a man one last three hours and, <laughs> and be able to not, you know, come too quickly. And the, they want to make sure that their woman's going to have a full body orgasm and be hanging from the chandelier and all this different stuff. But when it gets right down to it, the work that has to be done is, well, you got to be able to feel yourself. And then you need to be able to be present enough to feel your partner. And that is right. outside of the bedroom. Right. That's just, where that has to early, happen. Yeah. It has yeah. to start. It has to be a 24 hours, seven day a week thing. Mm -hmm. There's a constancy. It be, it's a, a habit that you have to form. If you want to have that river of consciousness between two people, then it has to be a constant, a river of consciousness, yeah. Yeah. which means that you're constantly communicating. And that communication is not just verbal communication. No. It is, it is that feeling. It is yeah. taking the time to, you know, look your partner in the eye. 
And the majority of people don't make eye contact with their partners. They don't make eye contact with anybody, but they don't make eye contact with their partner. They're hiding from their partner. Right. Over and over again, when I'm working with couples, I hear, oh, they're my best friend, but I, I can talk to them about anything except for that. Yeah. And it's That's always indeed. the bedroom. It's always the yeah. bedroom stuff. I can't yeah. talk to them about the bedroom stuff. Well, yeah. you're having sex with them. Why can't you talk to them about, they're the ones that you're having sex with. Uh, so why can't you talk to them about sex? Oh, well, I don't, I don't want to bust his ego. Oh. Uh, yeah. Well. <laughs> how about giving him a how-to? How about actually like <laughs> communicating and saying, hey, this is how I want to be touched. This yeah. feels good. That doesn't feel good. You know, yeah. or just focusing in on the positive. You know, I have played with that numerous times. Like, oh man, I love this. And next thing I know, you know, that's exactly what's happening. I just, and I just make the statement of, I really love it when you do this. You see that this is what we're, we were saying earlier. Well, then the last one is if you come at it, you say, look, yeah, I need you to do this or I need you to do that. A lot of guys will recoil. Right. It's like, oh, I'm doing it wrong. Now you're talking about doing it wrong. Right. Now you're you know? nagging. But if you say, you know, I'd love if you did this. That's different. Or here's the thing. Most people don't, re- they're not present enough to know their play-by-plays in that situation or in any situation. So just saying, I love it when you do. Yeah. I'm I'm affirming that you already do this. I'm going to speak it into existence by telling you that you already do it. So you're going to, and I'm going to be excited about it. Right. And that's going to, I'm going to tell you, oh, wow, that just makes me so wet when you do this. Yeah. Right. And then what's a guy going to do? Well, pfft, do it, I'm doing that. <laughs> I didn't know I was doing it, but I'm going to do, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, that's, that's getting yeah. on there, right? That's yeah. definitely going to be there. And yeah. then all of a sudden he's doing exactly what you want. Sure. You know, and it's like, well, it. and it's just a matter of, but that's basic communication on anything. You went, you know, it's like you got personal story. I was, um, my guy was told me that he didn't want to drink coffee after five o'clock anymore because it, you know, messes with him, right? Mm -hmm. So then I come in the back door and he's over at the coffee pot and he's getting ready to make coffee. And I looked at him and I said, you're making some tea? Would you make me a cup too? Uh And he goes, "Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm making tea. Sure, I'll make you a cup too. Uh Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I didn't, so I didn't, I didn't say anything. You know, I was just, I made the assumption. Yeah. Look to my lips. Are you making tea? Awesome. Would you make me a cup too, please? Yeah. You know? he and he instantly just went, oh, oh, yep, yep, that's exactly what I'm doing. And he made the wiser choice for himself out of that. And I never guilted him, didn't shame him, didn't do anything. I just did an assumption, yeah. assumptive move of, of leading him the direction that he had asked me to take him anyway. Right. Right? That's cool. So. That's a good move. Yeah. yeah, it's always better, you know, you, when you're pretty communicating to – lay off the attacks or the, the directives, you know what I'm saying? You redirect, don't direct. You know redirect, to ask questions, <laughs> feel, yeah. realize that often what you're feeling or what you're thinking is your perception of the situation. Just because two people are in the same room together, your perception of this space and our, this conversation is opposite probably of what my perception yeah, of the space no is and our conversation because we're coming at it from our histories, mm-hmm. from our frequencies from our life situations in the current and in the past and what our goals are for the future. So my thought processes are gonna be completely different. My feelings are gonna be different than yours, everything. Even Mm -hmm. though here we are, two people in the same space Uh with everything exactly the same going on right now, our environment's the same. Yeah, yeah, this perception like that red wouldn't be the same red for you as it would be for me. Right. Actually, you know, the Dianetic thing I was talking about in the, the earlier one, that's how that works. It actually, what they're saying, what they try to do is they direct. Trying to get you to a state of clear, if I remember yeah, right. Because I, rem- I did some Scientology and the started. I- yeah, the public. idea is to get rid of the distractions. Right. And the stuff that they call them engrams, things that go on in your subconscious that you don't realize. Um, like I had a wife at the time, wife number two. And uh, she was raped by her father like a bunch of times till she almost bled to death. Because she's only 12. Yeah. And this guy was six foot, you know, big old guy, and he just tore up. Anyway, she was obsessed with him loving, liking her. Just out of control obsessed. And I had just gotten into the Dianetics to try to figure out my own twists. Mm-hmm. And um, ironically, is when I got it understood, we had to split up. Because she wouldn't take the trip. Right. You see? But anyway, 
Um, she wasn't ready to let go. She mm-hmm. wasn't ready to just go ahead and move, much right. like you accepting she, your she, gift, she, right? Yeah, she died at 49, you know, from just a multitude of different ailments. Uh, but what it does is, here, here's, let me start this way. When I first went there, they were teaching, I was learning to audit, which is kind of like hip, doing the doing the work, the hypnosis and mm-hmm. shit. And so this guy, and again, I'm still the knuckle dragger, right? So this guy hands me this tomato juice can, with all kinds of crap in it, like Legos and nuts and bolts and shit. He goes, show me how the mind works. I'm like, what? Look in there, how the, am I supposed to do that? You know? And I just agonized over it. It was so stupid. But I was like, I was, I was just getting mad, you know? It's like, come here, man. The guy comes over, I says, what the, give me something I can freaking use. This is nonsense. He goes, well, that's what you got to do, though. He didn't fight with me. I need him to fight with me, right? Mm-hmm. But anyway, he walks away. I thought, fuck. Never occurred to me to quit. But it's, I kept going through that. I was like, wow. I couldn't get it forked out, you know? Then finally I thought, what if I just pretended those pieces were more than the way they were, right? So I was able to do it. There's a whole diagram they put you through to right. how the mind works. And so I got done. It took me 45 minutes to get it done, and it was only a couple moves. But by the time I was done, I was sweating and shit, you know? So then they took me to the next step where I had to do this process on this doll. They gave me a goddamn doll. (laughs) And I'm from a background where if if my dad saw me with a doll when I was a kid, he'd beat me to death. (laughs) And so I've got this this doll, and of all things, it's a baby doll. And I'm looking at the damn thing. I got four lines to tell it. I go, close your eyes. Take a... (laughs) Shit. All right. Take a deep breath. Close the... I couldn't get it going. I couldn't get it going, man. And I was mad as hell. I was raising all kinds of hell, causing a scene. It was crazy as hell. Give me something else. No, you got to do that. They never got mad. They stayed calm the whole time, so I had no one to fight with. Mm-hmm. Finally, after it took me an hour and 45 minutes, it took me almost two hours to do it, finally I got through that whole phrase. And it was like, oh, oh my God. And I couldn't even, I, I was trembling. I was sweating like an animal, you know? And finally got it done, and I'm, stand, I'm walking out in the hallway, and I'm holding on to the wall because I couldn't even stand up very well. I was that wasted. And I'm going along the wall, and this guy comes up from this other side, and I had known him. His name, his name was Force, of all things. <laughs> and I said, he goes, well, it's not, I heard you did it. I said, yeah, I did. I had to deal with a baby doll, man. He goes, yeah. He says, I had to do a teddy bear, but I cleared that teddy bear. <laughs> and that was nothing to him to say that. He didn't know what he, he was just talking. But as I walked, I thought, what the hell was I doing? I was having a fit over material in plastic. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a baby. It wasn't a, you know, it didn't mean anything. It didn't make me gay. Right. And I thought, how fucking stupid am I? <laughs> you know? And I realized that I had been conditioned to see things a certain way, even when they're not. Right. And I think, really, if I was to actually look at that time, that was a huge turning point. Because you don't go with the stereotypicals. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that's a big turning point. The other stuff came later, but, you know. It was all about how your ego was. Right? Yeah. It was the ego challenge of facing the programs of your past. That uh, And a program I didn't know I had. Right. Because if you look at it, it's just a doll. It's just a doll. It's and just it's, a doll. And it doesn't even have to be a doll. It could be just a pile of thread and freaking, right. you Just know? some Legos, just a doll. Mm-hmm. Not a yeah. big deal. And so a lot of my work, when I do the intuitive stuff, like I'll see something and then um, I'll see a guy with his head down, for example, in a vision. And it quit being a guy with his head down and start becoming a depression or a heavy mm-hmm. energy or depending on how it felt with something else. Right. Like I'll see a picture and I might feel pressure here, which will mm-hmm. tell me that pressure and that picture was insignificant. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I start read. You know, at that point, I start reading my whole body, and which is what you're saying with this tantra. It's the same thing. It's like you're getting all of yourself involved. Right. Yeah. 
Well, simple. and if you're really wanting, you know, if you take it back to the sexual aspect of it, if you're wanting those mind blowing orgasms that touching the big toe of God, you have to have your whole self in it. Yeah. And you need to fully be able to unite with another person and mm. them have themselves fully in it. Yeah. That's the only way you're getting there is two people be two complete people, whole right. beings, whole beings yeah. coming together in their wholeness right. and uniting. And that's, you know, and being able to communicate at that level inside and outside the bedrooms. And that's where that energy transference comes in. As long as we're sitting around and we're looking at partners as though they are to complete us, they're to fulfill us. They're, you know, I'm broken, I'm broken, I was yeah. raped, I'm broken, I lost my house, I'm broken, I lost my job, I'm broken because of this, 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 this. The world always beats me down, the world always abuses me, whatever those programs are. I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough, I'm not lovable, you know, nobody cares, right. I'm only, whatever, whatever. We have a million and one. Right. of those but as long as we're running around we're like well but when I'm around this person I feel fulfilled I feel loved I feel this that sounds great but we're actually taking all of our personal power and handing it over to somebody else and yeah. then when that person goes away we're still broken yeah because the, everything was dependent on them in the land of Tantra it's really about self-fulfillment mm -hmm. and not I'm gonna be get fulfilled from somebody else I'm going to find that self-fulfillment in myself. I'm going to become the apple pie. Yeah. And I'm going to see how all of my life is woven together, which mm -hmm. is what Tantra is all about. It's the woven, the wovenness of all of life. It's like life is a great big tapestry. Absolutely. Sex is one string in there, or it's one segment of string, right? And But the picture of our life is everything. It's, you know, all those components. If we start to unravel any pieces of it, it's going to play a role in the whole tapestry. Sure. Right? Yeah. So we live in a world where we compartmentalize everything. And yeah. it's like, here's my work, here's my mother-in-law, here's my dog, mm -hmm. here's my fitness, here's my this, here's my fear over there, here's sex, here's spiritual stuff, whatever it is. Here's, yeah. you know, I'm political on views on this way or that way. We keep it all in these nice little tidy boxes in our head. Yeah. And then we, for the most part, close our emotion off to most of it. Right. Except for the things that we are the most comfortable showing emotion around, which in today's world is a lot of anger. Mm. Right? Yeah. We're quick to anger. We're quick to blame. We're quick to finger point on different things. Well, you don't, you, don't you think anger is misunderstood? It's a you know, subcategory emotion of sadness. We're yeah. not happy with something with ourselves. Typically, we're not happy with how we're showing up. We have no purpose. We mm -hmm. aren't fulfilled. We're not, we're not being the best person that we can be. So it's a lot easier to get angry. If I'm not happy with myself, it's a hell of a lot easier to get mad at you for doing something to me. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Even though you didn't do something to me. You just, just said, proceed. hey, you know, really? You already finished that water? Yeah. What, what do you mean? You know what you're saying that I'm, you know, <laughs> right? Water holic. right. <laughs> like whatever, yeah. you know, but we, we are really quick to anger and it's because we see the world attacking us. Yeah. But we're also taught that anger is strength. A lot of people, my dad used to think that it's like, is you can beat this ass, beat this guy's ass. That makes you more of a man. Right. You know, um, he taught that. I mean, when I was a kid, he used to tell me, he goes, like I didn't get thrown out of school. And he goes, you haven't been suspended. What's the problem? <laughs> so, well, I didn't do anything. You haven't been fighting? No. No, nope, don't have to fight. Yeah, he said to me, he goes, why not? Well, nobody's mad at me. Right. Yeah, he goes, you've been running? Then he goes, if you've been running, I find out I'm gonna beat you bloody. So, <laughs> you know, right. he saw it as, Literally, as he saw it as being a man. Yeah. Right. And there is a, f I think that there's a line there that our society probably has never really fully understood, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. that is the, the line of that anger is not necessarily a weakness nor a strength. It just is. It just is. It is a healthy emotion on the human scale. It is an emotion and it's something that we all experience. A healthy individual is going to experience the whole emotional scale. At, you know, at different as long points as you don't in life. Go into the destructive aspects. Unless you need to. 
Unless well, you absolutely need to, because here's the thing. We live in a, in a very, right. Yeah. We live in a passive world. On top of all of our anger, we live in a very passive world. Mm -hmm. We live in a world of, oh no, I'm going to turn the other cheek. I'm going to turn the other cheek. I'm going to turn the other cheek, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I don't have that one at all. that's not, <laughs> that's not a healthy thing either. Uh -huh. No. So if somebody is coming at you with a knife, right? Do you just go, oh, just, you know, let's think this through. Yeah. Right. Or do you defend yourself? I, like uh, this woman was telling me, cause I was saying, you know, people should own guns, especially in the bad areas and stuff. And she goes, you know, when somebody steals from me, the first thing I think is maybe they needed it more than I do. I thought, no, you didn't. <laughs> you thought that soccer took my shit. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of, you know, bullshit, you right. know, as far as that goes. Right. But the being, like you said, being angry is not a bad thing because it's, it's an emotion, thing. but being predatory is. Right. And carrying your anger as your It's a matter strength. of it can be, can you control it or not? Right. Can you use it in a healthy fashion or not? When my little boy, he was, I think it's first grade. He was a little, man, he was a really a interesting little kid. Little kid. And uh, he had gotten his desk moved up by the teacher or something like that. But anyways, he goes, Dad, he goes, you know what I did? I said, what? He goes, I was mad today. My teacher made me mad, and I kicked her desk. I said, you did? He goes, yeah. I said, wow, you weakened, huh? He goes, what? You weakened. You couldn't control yourself. He goes, he, you can see, you're kind of going, oh, shit. He goes, well, I didn't really do that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but to him, he thought that meant he was, tough guy right but when he saw it wasn't that cool he's going oh wait a minute right. you know what i mean it was actually kind of cute so. it's learning how to breathe yeah. breathe through any situation yeah and yeah. know when to exert yeah and when not to it's yeah. just like sometimes the healthiest and the strongest move is to run yeah you know? yeah other times the healthiest and strongest move is to fight yeah and but the majority of the time, the healthiest and the strongest move is to actually take a higher negotiate, road for it yeah. and to negotiate to view things differently, yeah. to not give into the fight because they are trying to draw you out. Right. And once you are drawn out, then you are not operating from soul. You're not operating in alignment. You're operating in a state of fear, which is a state of ego. Right. And it has you completely opposite of who you really truly are. Yeah. And, but what do we live in a world of right. fear right fear. it's being yeah and the thing is if if you don't act on that fear in the social areas you're actually seen as weak even right. though you're not it's not it's right. a, you see what i'm saying those who don't fight if you do not fight then you're instantly perceived as weak yeah yeah right. so it's a little twisted but <laughs> that's the job is don't twist it right so. and back to what you were asking me tantra i mean the gist of it you know bringing it back to the sexy word of Tantra there is that what people don't understand and kind of where I have that full circle is that what I learned as a child and some of my belief structures as a child and as a young adult and everything was more around the energetics and the whole tapestry of things Yeah. to see the whole picture and that everything is interwoven. Right. You know, my action of today actually is a ripple effect on not just myself, but on the world. Mm -hmm. So the more light I reveal in the world, the better off it is to my situation, but also mm. to the world situation. Yeah. You know? And yeah, and when we go through darkness, it is creating contrast in our life. It's just allowing us to see something differently so that we know what we want and what we don't want, right? Right. I mean, you got be beautiful experiences. Mm -hmm. There was some struggle back there, some pain. Yeah, right, a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> from that, yeah, look at what you now know today, right? Well, that's the truth because nobody can shock me, you know. It's saying when I do readings, right. nobody shocked me, and I don't judge because I know how people are, and people are always in, in a state of change or a state of learning, so you can't really judge that. All you can do is say, Yeah, I see where you're headed, right? This is where you're headed, this is what'll happen. Uh, why don't you adjust? You can adjust this way, and it'll go this way. Right. That's really how it works, mm -hmm. how I do what I do. Anyway, because I don't believe there's anything bad, you know, depending on... It's just perception. Perception, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, some cultures, sex is bad. I don't know what they are <laughs> because unless it's just hiding, you know, you hide behind a barn or whatever. Well, anyway, the point being is in all, in, in all, uh, I'm off track. I can't remember what I was going to say. So whatever, whatever. Okay. <laughs> but everything that I've learned through the craziness helps in what I do. So my answer to that is basically I needed to do the crazy in order to be where I needed to go. You see? And I think that's the way for everybody. I mean, if they've been through some bad shit, they just needed to take a shot at it or deal with it. And then you come out a little stronger in that area. You know what I'm saying? And uh, to me, the ultimate is to be in a situation to where, and this is the ultimate. No, I don't think anybody's been here. But the ultimate to where you've been in a situation to where uh, you don't have all these triggers. You know, okay, I'm staying in my space. Then somebody just says something wrong, you lose your mind. You got to get rid of that. Right. You know what well, I'm saying? Well, that's not an energetically or emotionally mature person. Right. Yeah, but it's common. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really it's, common. That's more, you know, that's the reactive. If we were talking to Stephen Covey, that's the reactive nature, not the proactive nature. Mm-hmm. And we yeah. live in a society that is extremely re- reactive. And, you know, it's like, oh, no, everybody's always attacking me. And it's because of that program. And then if you look at what society teaches us, Mm. what our media even teaches us, right? Schools, politics, religion, our neighbors, our parents, everybody tells us, oh, you need to protect yourself because this is a mean world, Mm. right? And it's out to get you. Yeah. And And then we see that evidence showing up all over the place because that's where everybody's focus is at. Right. is on that mm-hmm. and then of course what are we going to do we're going to run around we're going to feel attacked which makes us reactive not proactive but then there's different techniques education out there tantra being one of many mm-hmm. you know yoga is a sister belief structure to tantra yeah but you know what i um aikido aikido is a martial art mm-hmm. but it's not so much combat it's combative but it's uh, more redirect of. Mm-hmm. And as I started to learn that, I learned that in Taekwondo and the Marine Corps. And then I have a really good friend who's expert, uh, a keto expert. She's got it to a point where no one gets hurt. If somebody attacks you, you just redirect. Right. You redirect and you lay them down, con- you know, uh, gently. Right. Or you do what you have to do, but you do it so he doesn't get hurt. You just redirect everything. Right. And that's life. That's the whole freaking life, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's all about redirection. And you got something that's an adversarial, you redirect until it isn't. And you do it in such a way that nobody gets jammed. It's just everybody understands. And that's the answer. And uh, like we were talking about before, it's like uh, relationships. That's what you need to kind of be doing that way is learn to redirect instead of learning about heads. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because nobody wins. Right. That happens. But the realization has to come into play there that sometimes you'll redirect yourself right out of the relationship because that's the healthiest path yeah. to to take for both parties because sometimes when Well, you when have, you're impossible to redirect. Right. Well, the redirection redirects right into a separation of the relationship, and it's mainly because one person is staying in a reactive nature and the other person is trying to be proactive. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, there's only so far you can go. You can, but it's a, it's a technique that can be done and it works. But as you said, some just won't roll there. Right. And you got to let it go. Yeah. Because there's no, um, there's no way, there's no really one thing you can do that'll fix everything. Right. You know, all you can do is redirect, redirect. And then if it gets where you can't reconnect and you have to let go, you know. And uh, I actually created a prison system that I'm putting in a book right now. That is based on redirection, and it, it's based on really no retaliatory stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's taken somebody that's super aberrant, you know, super predatory, dropping them down into the infantile environment, meaning everything is done for them, and they have to be watched, everything they do. And they have to graduate. They don't get out in three years for sure, ten years for sure. They graduate. Okay. And... A guy that's wrongly accused of of murder, for example, right. in my system could come out in under three years. And a guy that 
is it? It was, did actually do it. And he may take 20, you know? And uh, anyway, I don't know I'm talking about this. <laughs> Basically, because what I'm saying is if, if we redirect people that say they're real destructive folks, just redirect. It's like, okay, look, this is where you are and this is what it's done. So since you can't control here, let us put you in a safer place to where you can't get in trouble. Now, as you learn what you need to learn, you get in the tools. Uh, in the system that I have, they do six hours in academics and six hours in uh, in uh, psycho psychology, you know, psychological. And as they use these different tools, then they can graduate. And they know that if I do this, then I'll be able to do this. And then they find their way out. It's just a graduation. Because mm -hmm. you can't just take someone, okay, you did this, so I'm going to beat the crap out of you, and you're going to come out better. No, you have to redirect the thinking. Mm -hmm. Just like in, in sex, you got to redirect the thinking. You can't force anything going either way, you see. In politics, the same thing. You can't, the peck of woods, they're not doing anything because they just beat each other up, right? And they have no, it has nothing, nothing to do with us. Right. You know, so you have to, we have to redirect the politics even. Okay, we got to bring people in that are a little more more elevated in their thinking. We have to put them through something that, uh, you know, they know that if they go too far this one direction, then it's not going to be good, you know, but they have no checks and balances. So everything has to be redacted, and that's just the way it seems like to me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, I mean, whatever, whatever. <laughs> so, anyway... So what do you mostly, mostly teach now? You know, Now I am really just focused on life happiness, on abundance, really learning. I've been focusing more on what I refer to as prosperity lifestyle coaching. Mm -hmm. And it's focused around just creating a not, for anybody who doesn't want average and ordinary in their love, their money, or their life happiness picture. Yeah, I'm extreme. And it's just like just yeah, just really focusing in on the principles of manifestation. You know, the thought, how our thoughts and emotions direct our whole life, mm -hmm. and how we can not have those triggers and so, release the emotion that's stored in the physical body. So, do you have a program you put them through, or do you just counsel? It's a lot of intuitive work. A lot of work. Yeah. A lot of intuitive work. I do have courses that I have online that are scripted. You know, for the basics to get somebody through something. So if somebody can't afford my private services, then there are options to get them to that next level, next sure. level out there. But yeah, a lot of the times when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, it's just very focused on, it's the intuitive of what's coming up and then just calling them on their shit, right? And, yeah. you know, right there, I just call it on there and then dealing with, you know, the different things that are coming up. Oh, well, that's, you're feeling this, you're, that's the emotion there. Well, this is what that means. How does that relate to the thoughts that you're thinking right now, to your actions right now? You know, yeah. How are you in, you say that you want this, but is your belief lined up with your desire? Right. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, I want it. I believe that I can't have it. Is that true? Because it would be here. Yeah, you already be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> it'll already be here. The lover would be in your bed if you actually believed you could have the lover in your bed. Right? Yeah. But you don't believe that you can have the love. Well, you, no, I had, you know, I was with somebody last week. Yeah, but you hated that person. You know, they were an <laughs> ass. You just got done telling me about how you felt used and abused in that situation, that they were not the kind of person that you wanted to draw into your life. So what's up with that? Oh, the last five people you told me about was that kind of person right there. Yeah. So what's the actual, so you believe that you can have the lover in your bed, but you don't believe the lover that you want can right. be in your bed. Yeah. Where is that at? How do we remove that? Let's, let's become the person so that we yeah. can have the person. I like that. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. I, anyway, whatever. Um, like, well, this is what I, what I do. The first thing I do is, uh, my issue is I have to break them, bring them into intuitive possibilities. You see what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. if people use their intuition more, more, they would get a less bullshit less, right. you know? And the first thing, I have a couple of things that I have them do. One is I teach them, uh, when you think of a person, what animal would they be? And it's like, animal, what? You know, and they ultimately go, what do animal would I be, you know? I told this one, you're a cow, baby. And, 
it, it wasn't a bad thing. She wasn't, a, you know, a cow. But what it meant was she was very, kind of methodical in her movements. Right. Uh, she was not easily freaked out. You know, that that's what it meant. As soon as you figure out what animal it is, then you figure out the characteristics that fit. Like, um, I know a guy who used to go, uh, he says, sometimes, he's from France, sometimes I feel <coughs> like I'm the snake crawling around behind the people. <laughs> See, I told him he, was, he knew he was sneaky, mm-hmm. and he was. He was horribly sneaky. But he was telling me he was without even realizing he was doing it, you know? And he damn sure was. But, uh, like, I was dating this girl. She, she was absolutely a Persian cat. But she was all dirty. <laughs> and what that meant to me was she had a soft nature. She was easily, you know, um, cuddled and shit. But she had a lot of shit around her that was hurting her or that was um, keeping her from being who she was. You know? So it works. It works. And uh, the funny thing is, is uh, I teach a lot of shit. Oh, yeah. I teach a lot of, if you can think it, you can do it. Mm-hmm. And if you can do it in your mind, you can affect it energetically. You know, like, uh, real quick, um, I gave up women for about 30 seconds once. <laughs> well, actually, I was really just jacked up about this relationship I just had. So I go to Dominican, right? And I'm in the Dominican, and I'm saying, all right, out loud, I went, damn it, no more, no more. They're driving me freaking crazy. And this woman who I had a crush on in the 90s called me. I said, God damn. She goes, well, you know who this is? I said, yeah, it's Amy. You know? Maybe I should have did that. Anyway, one thing led to another. Her and I had this constant off and on crush on this little girl. But things, circumstances would keep it away, you see. And I could feel when I would talk to her, I'd be spitting all love all over her, you know. <laughs> and I was while I'm doing that, I'm going, I don't know what the hell's wrong with me, you know. But I was like that, you know, if I was around, I needed to hug her, mm-hmm. right? And I knew it wasn't real because who she was really wasn't what I was interested in. I thought, God damn, must be that, you know, there must be some sort of past life thing or whatever, right? And so our past life means, okay, if I'm dealing, if I'm attracted to her for no particular reason or because, and it's conflicted of our in, inner involvement, then it must be something outside of this reality right okay so i decide okay then what needs to happen we need to synchronize that with now or it won't work and it was driving me goddamn nuts and this wasn't that long ago you know well four or five years anyway so i decided i was going to put the early relationship inside of a bubble Mm -hmm. it's actually shamanic technique well a derivative is a shamanic technique i put the energy the Relationship inside the bubble. I imagine seeing the energy work, the relationship working around inside this mm-hmm. bubble, and I put it over here. You know, imagine it over here. Mm-hmm. When I did that, I didn't feel any less conflicts no more. And I said, okay, I know what's going to have to happen. This is actually going to come together, or it'll end it. And the funny thing is, one day I almost heard a snap. I don't know. That might have been my intention, but it's like all of a sudden it wasn't there anymore. The ball was gone. And I thought, damn. Then I thought, I ain't feeling nothing for her. I literally, I was so creaked, creaked, freaked out by it. I called her up and says, Amy, I don't feel nothing for you now, man. <laughs> <laughs> she went, she did not take that right. <laughs> but, you know, it's energetics. If you use your vibration, you use your understanding, your vision to create what you need, then you can create what you have. Do you say any whatever, whatever? Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. we're going to have to slide. <laughs> I think the light's about to go off. So anyway, I uh, hope you all like this. Uh, leave comments um, in the YouTube thing. Um, we're going to do this again. Every week we're going to be doing one of these guys. Um, if you want to hear something specific, a specific subject or some topic or even something going on that you want to understand a little better, and maybe we can help. Uh, just let us know and we got to go. All right, man.